Hey everybody, I am two hours late today and I apologize. If you're watching this on YouTube, it won't matter because you're watching it when you're watching it. But if you watch me live, I do apologize if you were waiting. I do these Facebook live broadcasts every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. It's called Weight Loss Wednesday and this is my 11th episode. Uh, we did 10 and we've been picked up for another 10 episodes, yay. And so my friend and camera person, it's not really a camera, it's only done through the iPhone, Kenny, usually gets here around 1.30 and I give him lunch and then we get ready to go. We've got lights and we've got a screen. It takes my husband a while to set up to go at two o'clock live. We get the questions in advance and we just could not connect. And it wasn't just my, it wasn't my technology. We called other people in the area. I don't know if it was a Facebook glitch. It wasn't the Wi-Fi. It wasn't the phone. We just could not get onto broadcast. He kept saying broadcast failed, broadcast failed. And we tried to do this through a YouTube live, but never having done that before, it, it just didn't work out. So I do apologize if you waited around for me. It's, you know, this is a free, uh, technology Facebook Live and I guess we know now sometimes it doesn't work so I am going to try to have a backup in the future because Kenny has left now it's now two hours later there if you're typing I apologize I I would have to go like this to see it um, I'm assuming you can hear me because you're there so I'll have to answer these questions later because otherwise I'll be just going like this and like this the whole time so thank you so much for being here and I do apologize for starting two hours late but better late than never right so welcome to Weight Loss Wednesdays. I'm Chef AJ. I'm the author of a book called Unprocessed, the host of a television show called Healthy Living with Chef AJ and the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which I hope you will consider joining if you're not already a member. So I'm going to start today with some of the questions that we have had. Let's see, they're right here. And uh, Weight Loss Wednesdays is a weekly series where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss, but We've been getting a lot of other questions, and since I'm a chef and I can answer them, I'm also happy to do that. So I'll answer the chef questions first. And Sally wants to know about a convection oven, why her convection oven is burning the spices when she cooks things like potatoes. So Sally, I apologize, I can't really answer that because I'm not really familiar with using a convection oven. I know that from what I've read that when you have a convection oven, you have to lower the temperature about 25 degrees of whatever the recipe calls for and cut the baking time as well but I really don't know the answer to that. The only thing I can advise you to do is to go buy an oven thermometer. You can get them for about $10 at either the hardware store or at a restaurant supply store because I would want to know that your oven is really calibrated to what you think it is. I used to be an apartment manager and we would get new ovens delivered all the time and residents would call that their oven wasn't working and I would bring out my oven thermometer and what theirs was 350, it was maybe 275. So the only thing I can really suggest if you can't get a new oven is to at least calibrate the one you have because if it's burning, it's possible that when you're cooking at what you think is 350, maybe it's not. So that's what I say to that. Now Dana wanted to tell everyone that if you live in Cincinnati and want to come see me in Detroit on December 12th and 13th, she's going to have a van and she's happy to take you. So if you want to come to Detroit and you don't live in Detroit and you live in Ohio and you want to ride with Dana, put it in the Facebook uh, chat and we'll get you hooked up with Dana. Dana wanted to know how to cook quinoa in an instant pot. So. The way I do it is I do one cup quinoa to one and a half cups of water or broth and I do it for about four minutes and let it rest for 10 minutes. But I do recommend you get a good pressure cooking cookbook and I have four of them. The first one I got was called, it is called, Great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure by Lorna Sass. And to my knowledge, this is the only vegan cookbook that has ever won a prestigious James Beard Award. And this is the first one I got and what I really love about it is the guide is the front cover and the back cover. So when I need to look something up, I don't have to like flip through the book. I just kind of have to open it up and I look it up and I'm looking at grains and it says quinoa, one and a, yeah, and it, it tells you right there exactly what to do. So I really recommend you get at least one pressure cooking book or download one of the free online resources like uh, pressure cooking for dummies, which you can do. There's some other In under pressure excellent as well and I've also interviewed this lovely lady JL Fields vegan pressure cooking 
So uh, none of them are SOS free, sugar free, oil, sugar, oil and salt free, but many of them are oil free or have options for it. And you know, just when in doubt, leave it out. You don't need the oil, sugar or salt. So they're all great books, but make sure you get at least one. And as far as cookbooks, people said, what recommendations do you have for cookbooks that are SOS free? Well, guys, there's only like three of them out there. So I'm gonna recommend my own unprocessed if you don't have it. I'm going to recommend my good friend, Chef Ramses Bravo's book. He's the executive chef at True North Health Bravo. There's some great recipes in here. And the newest one by my dear friend, Kathy Fisher, Straight Up Food. And what I think you're gonna love about this is it's got color photos. It's absolutely beautiful and it sits flat. So this is available on her website, Straight Up Food. And she, her food is amazing. And all of those are sugar-free. wait and unfortunately little Bailey not unfortunately but little Bailey wants to get in on the action so I'm sitting down today because we finally have a tripod set up for you guys because there have been some complaints and I can't use it because it just I don't know how to know if I'm in frame so here we go here's the question let me see um, hello chef and Charles my question for weight loss Wednesday deals with drinking water I hear different suggestions on the amount of water you should drink. Is the correct amount as much as you want, or is it ounces based on body weight, or as much as it takes to keep your urine clear? What do you think? And do you know if Dr. Lyle or Goldhammer have any advice on this subject? Thank you kindly, Jamie. So I, this seemed more like a Dr. Goldhammer question than a Dr. Uh, Lyle question, and so I did ask Dr. Goldhammer, and also I asked him what kind of water he recommends, because we get that a lot. Oh, it's freezing up. I'm sorry about that and it keeps pausing. If that happens, it is very possible that in the replay it won't happen uh, when we watch it again. So, and, and guys, there's nothing I can do about this technology. So, doing the best I can and hopefully you'll get a lot out of it. So, Dr. Goldhammer says, <clears throat> the purest water is steam distilled, but any well purified water should be fine. In other words, reverse osmosis or high quality filtered water as people that eat animal products, animal-based diets, and toxic, salty food. So that's his recommendation. Now, when I went to the Optimum Health Institute, what they said is for every pound of body weight, you drink half in ounces. So in other words, uh, it, okay, so I weigh, let's just round up to 120, I weigh about 117. So let's, because I'm bad at math, I can't do one half of 117. So let's go to 120. So half of that is 60, so that I would need 60 ounces of water, which is, eight, 64 so that'd be like seven and a half eight ounce glasses so I don't measure it but what I do is when I wake up in the morning I want a warm beverage so I drink this much in pot liquor what pot liquor is is that delicious warm elixir that's left over from the steaming of the vegetables it's heaven on earth you won't need coffee when you start drinking pot liquor that's what they call it in the south I like every kind of pot liquor with the exception of spinach it's the only one I don't like spinach and maybe something that had onion in it and um, so this is a 16 ounce bottle. So I'll drink at least one of these and that keeps me warm when I'm walking Bailey because it's pretty cold in the morning. This by the way is a fantastic bottle Nancy gave me. It keeps stuff warm for 24 hours. I still have some zucchini pot liquor in here that I didn't finish from the uh, next part. So I'll drink that for 16 ounces. And then this is my True North water bottle with our motto of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program bracelet on it which says, eat to the left of the red line. This is 24 ounces, and then I'll drink an unsweetened hibiscus tea. And so that's about all I drink in the daytime because if I drink like much after nine or 10 in the morning, I'm gonna be up all night, you know, peeing. So yeah, good, you're saying it's better now, Teresa. So the thing is, is but my diet is all water-rich foods, fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes. If you're drinking things like coffee or alcohol or soda or God forbid diet soda, these things are very, very dehydrating. And so you're gonna need to drink a lot more water if you're working outside, if you're exercising a lot. So they say that thirst is not a good guide because once you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So just make sure you're not eating salt or if you are not very much and that you're not eating dead decaying animal flesh and processed food, things that are gonna make you thirsty, things that have no water in it. See, everything I eat has water in it. Now, water in itself isn't good for weight loss. In other words, it does fill you up and it exits the digestive tract too quickly. 
But when you combine water with foods, that's the key to the kingdom for satiety. Because when you have foods that have water in them intact and fiber in them intact, what you have water plus fiber equals bulk and bulk creates satiety. That's why I don't recommend things like air pop popcorn for weight loss because it people say, well, it's only 34 calories a cup, but it's 1800 calories a pound. It has no fiber. You want to make sure that all the foods you eat have water in them intact and fiber in them intact, which is why I don't recommend dehydrated foods in general or for weight loss. So you want to have the water in the food. You don't want to juice and blend it because the liquid calories are not favorable for weight loss or for satiety, especially if they come from alcohol. So that's the thing on water. So somebody else asked, what does, what does Dr. Goldhammer eat in a day? And I asked him if I could shoot him when I went uh, True North, but he says he basically eats the same thing every day. He eats 20 out of 21 of his meals at True North and pretty much eats almost identically to me. So doc, this is, again, this is Weight Loss Wednesday with Dr. Goldhammer, who's not even here. But so he says that he eats for breakfast, he eats fruit, oatmeal, and greens. For lunch, he eats salad, steamed vegetables, and starchy vegetables. For dinner, he eats salad, steamed vegetables, and grains or beans. And that pretty much sounds like my diet. He says if he needs additional calories, then he will eat more fruit, and he will add up, he will add up to one ounce of raw nuts or a half, an avocado, half of an avocado on occasion to lunch or dinner. And I know he does play basketball, so maybe that's the days he needs more calories. So. That's what Dr. Goldhammer eats, and I've eaten with him, and he eats very large portions of these calorie dilute foods, and he looks great. He's been doing it for 40 years, perfect skin, no health problems, no medications. So there you have it. So we're done with the Dr. Goldhammer portion of today's Weight Loss Wednesdays, and so let's get to some of the other questions. Alrighty, so here we have a question from Diane. She says, um, People, um, what is a set amount of legume? Are legumes considered a starch? Yes, they are. So the starches are potatoes, sweet potatoes, and winter squashes, things like acorn, kabocha, hubbernut, hubbard squash, butternut, 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 butternut squash, delicata squash, the winter squashes, not the zucchini summer squashes. The winter squashes, potatoes, and sweet potatoes are the lowest calorie dense starches. These are 400 calories a pound. Then we have the grains, whether they have gluten or not, the whole grains, quinoa, teff, amaranth, millet, oats, things like wild rice, pseudo grains like that, buckwheat, which is a grass, I believe. These are 500 calories a pound. Corn is also a grain. And then at 550 to 600 calories a pound, we have the legume family. These are beans, split peas, and lentils. And so yes, they are considered a starch. And so people that, have, people, uh, that eat them, what set amount should we eat per day? You know, uh, half a cup, a cup. I, you know, I don't give measurements of food because the ultimate weight loss program is based on learning to get in touch with your body's wisdom of eating when hungry and stopping when full. No one could have ever gotten overweight unless they were either A, eating outside the demands of true hunger, which is done often for emotional reasons, or because you're not eating the right food, foods that fool your brain's satiety mechanisms like sugar, oil, salt, and flour, animal products, and processed food. And so I don't like to give measurements for any food, and that bothers some people, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in today's episode. But you know, a can of beans is about one and a half cups. So when I used to eat beans, I eat the whole can. I mean, or I just eat as many as I want until I'm full. So I can't give you an amount. Um, I, you know, you can look at what other, some of the other doctors say. I know that Dr. Greger has beans on his, I believe it's called a daily dozen, and Dr. Furman has them. Whether they give amounts, I don't know. So if that's the starch, you just eat as much as you want until you're full. As long as you're not putting animal products and dairy and sugar and oil and salt and flour on it, you can eat as much as you want of these, these foods. And we'll talk about that a little more. You know, I can't just explain everything I know about calorie density in these segments. That's why if you join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, the first module talks about that completely. It's, it's, it's a long lecture called The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, which I'll be giving in Detroit on December 13th. And for $29, you can buy the three-hour seminar and watch that lecture because then you'll understand that when you understand calorie density, you can eat these foods ad libitum, the foods to the left of the red line, which beans are. So that's why I can't say, well, eat a half a cup, eat a cup. You know, you want to vary your starch. You don't want to eat the same bean in the same amount every day. You want to eat the different beans. There's 18,000 different kinds of legumes. So you want to switch that up a little bit. But I don't give measurements. I didn't give measurements in my book on process, and that bothered a lot of people. But, you know, human beings, 
throughout human history have never weighed and measured their food and they never no animal in na nature weighs and measures food it's only when you're eating the wrong food which are processed foods animal products or food that you added sugar oil salt and flour to that you have to worry about weighing and measuring we're going to again talk about that a little bit more later in the day i've heard diane also says i've heard you mention sweet potatoes are your favorite food i'm wondering if you also uh, eat much rice or other grains yeah i do i i just i like potatoes the best and squashes they just are the most satiating to me they're the most delicious I do love rice uh, I love brown rice especially it's called Texmati brown rice which I get in Texas and I buy the organic online at Amazon I love wild rice which is a um, I believe that's a grass and quinoa which is a seed my husband's allergic to quinoa so I don't get to eat that at home so I do like grains but I do find that grains I have a greater propensity to overeat on they're only a little bit higher in caloric density, but they seem to have some kind of opiate-like effect, especially oats, especially rolled oats. Whereas if you give me, you know, roasted sweet potatoes or, or kabocha squash in the Instant Pot, I'll eat, you know, a certain amount, probably one, one and a half, two pounds, and I'm done. But there's something, just the smell of rice, the smell of grains, there's something about grains in me, and I've heard this from some of my other clients and members of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program where with grains, we just keep eating and eating. So I don't avoid grains and I generally have my grains at dinner. I'll usually, like tonight I'm having the creamy curried kabocha squash soup, which if you want that recipe, we're doing the webinar again for the holiday feast on December 10th, one of my best recipes. So I'll probably have two, two and a half cups of that soup over two cups of either wild rice or rice. So not that I weigh and measure my food, it's just that people keep asking, so I'm noticing how much. But you know, it's very easy to go back for those grains because there's just something about about grains I don't know what it is where it's let's say I will just eat more of those than I will say of beans or potatoes but yeah I do eat grains and I love grains I find that you know when I travel which is all the time grains are probably the easiest starch to get because you can almost always get brown rice or white rice somewhere or at a restaurant you know you can travel with already cooked organic quinoa or brown rice in those little aseptic things and eat it cold if you have to or microwave it so yeah I do eat grains I don't eat oats so much anymore and we're going to talk about that because that's the next question so do you eat oatmeal either rolled oats or steel cut oats I understand Dr. Goldhammer has advised you to avoid gluten because of your thyroid condition there are various schools of thoughts as to whether oats contain gluten well here's the thing oats don't contain gluten the grains that contain gluten are you think of your eyebrow b-r-o-w-s brows barley rye well not that they contain gluten but the ones that people that have true gluten allergy or celiacs have to worry about it. barley rye oat wheat spelt and, and I think trichotelli too and the reason oats are a problem for some people and or at least the people that have a sensitivity have to buy gluten-free oats is because of often where they're grown or where they're sourced so a lot of times they're made in a factory that may have glutinous grains and there can be cross-contamination but oats just by themselves do not contain gluten and so at true north it's gluten-free and you know it costs anywhere from two to four times as much to get these gluten-free oats but for people that have that sensitivity that has to be and one of the reasons I avoid gluten isn't just because of my thyroid is because what I've learned from other doctors at True North like Dr. Erwin Linsner and from food addiction expert Dr. Joan Ifflin and I refer you to both of the teleclasses that I did with them which you can get on my other website healthy taste online is because it for treating food addiction gluten even if it's in a healthy whole grain like couscous or some pearled barley in our brain turns to gluteomorphine the same way that when you eat dairy products with casein it turns to casomorphine which is an opiate so for people suffering from this disease of refined food addiction we want to avoid gluten and the glutinous grains even if they're in their healthy whole food form so uh, as far as oatmeal is concerned I don't want to say I never eat it but uh, if I'm going to overeat it's probably going to be on oatmeal and rolled oats to me are just too processed you know the more food is processed the worse it is for weight loss the less it's processed the better it is for weight loss so I encourage people that eat oats to eat the oat groat which is very much like rice and it's absolutely delicious that is the first incarnation that is the healthiest that is the whole grain that's what I encourage people to eat um, most people that eat oats that have to eat it every day they're eating rolled oats with lots of fruit and we're going to discuss that in a minute because we, we have some interesting things we're noticing about these uh, daily oatmeal eaters that the next incarnation would be the steel cut oat. I see Jennifer Dyson. Hello, she's so awesome. I like her little dimples. So the next incarnation is the steel cut oats, which is a little bit 
uh, more processed than the oat groat, but less processed than the rolled oat. And again, you know, anytime you cut a whole grain with a sharp blade and you, you take an intact grain, and what happens is now you have a broken grain. And what happens is when you eat that, it, you have a, an increased surface area, which increases the absorption in the intestine, which means that now your blood sugar is raised more quickly, your insulin is raised more quickly, and insulin is the hormone responsible for driving fat into the cells, which is why it's better to eat your whole food as whole as possible. Not to say that you can't eat steel cut oats, but most people eat either the rolled oats or the instant oats, which are steamed they're technically not raw they're flattened and they're steamed and what happens is a lot of times people just can't stop eating these because in the ultimate weight loss program where we deal not just with weight loss but for overall health and food addiction you know we are an abstinence program we do not eat sugar flour or alcohol and what happens is because it's very hard for people to give up sugar and flour what they do is they switch to oatmeal and fruit because what happens is the oats, these rolled oats, which are very processed, becomes like their flour or their bread and the fruit becomes like their sugar and together it's like their cake. And we recommend you start your day in a savory way and it, and with, with vegetables in, in some way, shape or form. And many people just can't do that. They can't forego their oats because I do believe they have some kind of opiate addictive like quality because why else would people not be able to not eat them? They have to eat their oats every day. Some people are putting, you know, peanut butter in them or almond butter or cacao powder and things like that and, you know, lots of nuts and things like that. And then, you know, basically what you're eating is dessert. And so when people absolutely have to eat oats, I recommend they eat savory oats, you know, with vegetables and kale and maybe shiitake mushrooms, that kind of thing. I have a recipe in my first webinar for what I call risotto, which is tastes like risotto but it's made from uh, basil and sun-dried tomatoes. So uh, I, I don't eat oats very often because I don't want to say they're a trigger food for me. I think I can stop eating them. I'll use them in recipes judiciously like the blueberry mill oat muffin. But I got to tell you, if you saw my Facebook Live on Saturday that I did with the Salad Master representative, we made pancakes out of three ingredients, oats, almond milk and bananas, which you wouldn't think would be a problem, but boy, was that a trigger for me. I wouldn't even taste it because just smelling it, it I mean, it was a pancake. And the problem is, is when you have a food in its whole form and you just eat it plain, like oats and water, which I've eaten once and it's kind of disgusting, by the way. It didn't like I can eat plain rice, but if you've ever had just boiled oatmeal with water and nothing on it, no salt, no sugar, no fruit, it's pretty nasty. You know, um, but when you configure it into a dessert, something changes. And when you cook it into this little pancake, you know, just calling it a pancake or a cookie or a muffin or a bar, when you suffer from the disease of food addiction, you're looking for these things. And so I think you're treading into a dangerous zone when you start treading into those waters. You know, uh, one of the, curl, the girls, uh, Vivica, had asked about uh, uh, Dr. Goldhammer last week on the webinar that, you know, that when she makes uh, a recipe for baked oatmeal where she takes the oats and actually bakes it with fruit, she can't stop eating it. Whereas if she were to just eat oats with fruit, it's not a problem. And he explained that when you concentrate things, when you cook them and you know, you're cooking the water out, it becomes more calorically dense, more hyper palatable. And so it can be a problem. So I don't not eat oats, but I don't seek to eat oats. I, I reserve that usually like for when I'm traveling and that's the best choice of starch I can get. I carry these little things, which if Bailey wasn't sitting on my lap, I'd go to the kitchen and show you. They're called Umpqua Oats, U-M-P-Q-U-A. They have no sugar. And um, you know, I have that for like emergency or a little bag of my overnight muesli. But I don't not eat oats, but it's not my grain of choice. And my starch of choice is always potatoes, sweet potatoes, or squash, because I don't have a problem with overeating on those. So thank you for the question. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Oh boy, I better look at the clock, because I actually got a webinar at five o'clock, so I hope I get this done. Alrighty, oh, I hope I pronounced your name right. It's M-E-M-E, -M -E. it's maybe Mimi or Mei Mei. I actually had a French aunt, and that was her name. We pronounced it Mei Mei. So uh, she wants to know if, uh, how I feel about flax and chia seeds and I think they're fine. You know, uh, seeds are high in fat. They're also high in something that you need called omega-3 fatty acids, how much you need. Different doctors will give you different opinions. I know that when I read the best-selling Forks Over Knives book uh, by Letterman and Pulde, they said we need maybe as little as like a quarter teaspoon a day. Some doctors say have a tablespoon a day. So there's a less propensity for people that are emotional eaters or food addicts to binge on seeds like flax seeds and chia seeds than on any of the nuts or nut butters or tahini or even seeds like pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds. Let's face it, ground flax seeds aren't that 
interesting to most of us. They don't taste that good. Same with chia seeds. So they're still, they're still high fat, high calorie. They're about 2,600 calories a pound, which is less than nuts, which is 3,000 calories a pound. But you don't need that much if you're worried about your omega-3 fatty acid level. You could take, you know, one, two, three teaspoons at the most, which is a tablespoon on your salad every day, or sprinkle them uh, if you have oatmeal on your oatmeal or any cooked cereal. I'm not sure you need that much every day. And plus, you know, realize if you are overweight, I really don't believe you're going to become fatty acid deficient in like, say, three weeks, because when you come to the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we ask you to eat a very low fat diet for the first 21 days. We don't tell people they can't eat nuts and seeds and avocado forever. Oil, yes. Dairy products, yes, forever. But it, just to neuroadapt to that lower fat diet, we find if we just take it all away at the beginning, it makes it a little bit easier. But if somebody wants to keep using the flax and the chia, it's not a problem. Uh, just make sure that when you have them, you keep them in the refrigerator, especially the flax seeds once they're ground because flax seeds have to be ground to be assimilated. So uh, that's the story on that. Uh, chia seeds, by the way, are wonderful because they're a thickener and you can use them in recipes. So if you're making, say, a salad dressing and you want it kind of thick and creamy, well, you add a tablespoon or so into the dressing and it, it, it gels up. And so that's a pretty cool thing about chia seeds. So they're kind of fun to use just from a culinary standpoint. If it's a white recipe, like a white cream sauce, you'd want to get white chia seeds because they're generally black and that would make it kind of a little spotty otherwise. All right, so May May also wants to know, how do you know if you're truly hungry? Well, that's a great question. So um, the way I know and the way I teach people to know is that if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're probably not hungry. And, you know, it, it, Hyperpalatable food, food to the right of the red line. I should, dun, 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 dun. sorry, I, I'm trying to read your questions, but I, you know, my eyes are, it's like this little for me, you know, my iPhone's about this big. So, any food will satisfy true hunger. That's how you know, May May. But if you need a specific food to satisfy your hunger, then it's probably not hunger. That's cravings, which are largely. Uh, a sign of food addiction and they're emotional basically and I learned about this and I, I apologize if I've told this story before but it's such a good one and I hope if she's uh, watching you know I learned it from you girl so I've been going to True North for the last six years they have a program every winter called the holiday cooking extravaganza and uh, on Christmas Day and New Year's Day Dr. Goldhammer lets the staff off and so I work with him and his son Gar in the kitchen and we do the food and we deliver the orders to the rooms now when I say we deliver the orders for people that have been fasting or coming off fast that maybe they're on lovely young lady who goes there to fast every year just for health reasons and she hadn't eaten I believe it was 10 days and this was her first food and we deliver them on plates with the metal thing and so she was my last delivery and I knew her and she said oh why don't you sit down let's talk and I'm like sure I didn't have to be back in the kitchen and she opened up the metal thing and she looked at this steamed plate of zucchini and she's smelling it and then she, you know like you would maybe a fine wine and then you know she takes her first bite of food in 10 days steamed zucchini and it was like watching the movie hearing that sally she was like oh <clears throat> i mean she was like basically having a food gasm and i went back to the kitchen and i made some zucchini and dr goldhammer said we're done we don't have any more orders i said i don't know. i gotta eat this zucchini i want what she's having and it really taught me that when you are truly hungry healthy, whole, natural food without sugar, oil, salt, and flour actually tastes really good. And one of the reasons that food doesn't taste good in its natural state is because we're so addicted to these other foods and we can't taste, you know, how good these food tastes. And so I personally know I'm truly hungry when my steamed zucchini in the morning starts calling me. So when I wake up, I steam my, my I'm getting my husband's breakfast ready. He eats his vegetables and he eats oatmeal. So I'm making that and I'm making his lunch and I'm making Bailey's breakfast. And all the while I'm steaming my vegetables or roasting them if I'm having balsamic Dijon glaze, Brussels sprouts or oven roasted ratatouille. But like today I had steamed zucchini. And so I make it and then I put it in this, I undercook it and then I put in this like Tupperware where it stays warm for hours and it kind of cooks a little bit more. And as I go around my day, you know, I see the ripe bananas over there and I'm like, hmm, you know, that would taste really good right now. Or I smell my husband's oatmeal and I'm like, hmm, that would taste pretty good right now. I could eat that or, you know, whatever, a roasted sweet potato. But when that zucchini starts calling to me and I'm like, hmm, I'm ready to eat that, that's how I know I'm hungry. 
personally. So, you know, hunger feels like different things to different people. Some people describe it as kind of a gnawing feeling or an emptiness in their stomach or a gurgling. I know Dr. Furman has described something called throat hunger and even when I fasted, I never felt that. I don't know what that is. But my litmus test is, is if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're probably not hungry. So I hope that helped, Mamie. Okay, so we have, oh, uh, uh, I hope I pronounced your name right. Shailene or Shailene wants to know how long to bake the clafouti on episode six of Healthy Living with Chef AJ, and the answer is about 45 to 50 minutes at 350. And she wants to know what I think of powdered peanut butter. Well, I think it's terrible. Because first of all, I don't recommend peanut butter even or peanuts, even if you eat nuts, peanuts are technically legume because there's a risk of aflatoxin. So if Dr. Goldhammer doesn't eat it, I don't eat it. Uh, I think peanut butter is more of a drug than a food. It's so addictive, especially when you mix it with sugar or chocolate or things like that. You took out the best part you're going to eat it is if you add sugar and salt. So I don't recommend it if just because the fat has been removed. I don't recommend it at all, and, and especially if you're trying to lose weight. I think peanut butter is a very addictive food. It's going to make you overeat. So, and what are you using it for? Are you sprinkling it on your kale, or are you putting it on bread, which I don't recommend. So, no, I don't recommend, I don't recommend any processed food. I don't recommend any food that comes in a can, a box, a bottle, or a bag, even if you're not trying to lose weight. I recommend food from a plant rather than food that's been, been manufactured in a plant. I recommend whole food, not processed food. So no, I am not a fan of that, and especially not a fan of that if you're a food addict or are trying to lose weight. So if you want to eat an ounce of nuts or seeds a day, you know, or have a tablespoon of almond butter, you know, if you, if you can calorically afford it, fine, but no processed food, so not a fan. So thank you, Shailene. All right, so here we go. I'm, uh, we have a question from Louisville, Kentucky from Tanya. And she says that when she showed her sisters what she would be eating, they were like, geez, this has to be over 2,000 calories. I was telling them about a taco bowl, a cup of rice, cup of black beans, cup of corn, salsa, lettuce, and tomatoes. There's no way that's 2,000 calories because I'm doing it off the top of my head. Cup of rice is 200, cup of beans is maybe 200, 200, yeah, there's no way that's 2,000 calories, not even five probably. Um, another meal of three potatoes with chili poured over it. I'm just curious, how many calories do you usually eat in a day? Can you explain to me how you lose weight when consuming so many calories? I know eating this way works. I just, it's just that I had no comeback for them. Grr. Thanks for spending time with us on Facebook. Okay, so um, I don't know how many calories I eat in a day, and I, I never wanted to know, but I get asked this so much that twice I've answered this question. One time when I was traveling to uh, Miami a few years ago, and I said, there's no way I could have eaten enough food today because I've been on a plane all day, and sure enough, when I plugged it into one of those online calorie counter things, it was about 1,800 calories. So I did it yesterday just for you, Tanya, but don't ask me because I don't believe that you, if you want the health and the body you deserve, you ever have to weigh and measure your food or yourself. But I did it for you yesterday uh, just to give you an answer. And, and here's the thing, this is why I would love for you to join the Ultimate Weight Loss Program or at least get that lecture, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, through the webinar that I did in Baltimore so that you can understand the concept of calorie density. Because when you truly understand the concept of calorie density, you can eat more and weigh less. You can literally take in twice as much food and eat half as many calories. And that's what I do. And I eat probably between six and 10 pounds of food a day now instead of what most Americans eat, which is about three to five pounds because I'm eating the most nutrient dense, calorie dilute food that's water rich. So yesterday I plugged my food in and it said that yesterday, uh, yesterday I did not have any exercise. I did not spin or do yoga. The only exercise I had was walking this little one and I walk her 45 minutes twice a day at a moderate pace. So yesterday I ate 1,754 calories. It said that my fat was 5.5 grams, zero cholesterol, sodium was 344, and again, I had no salt to my food. Uh, dietary fiber, 73.7 grams, protein, 41.65 grams, and carbohydrates, 407.5 grams. And so when people say carbs make you fat, yeah, well, I'm not fat, and I eat over 400 grams of carbohydrates a day, and I get plenty of protein. So that was yesterday. I'm five foot six inches tall. My weight is about 117, plus or minus three. That's what it's been for the last uh, five years. And before that, I weighed 160 from the age of five to the 200, to almost 200 by the 20s. So uh, 
That was for the first 52 years of my life. So, so I don't count calories, I don't count carbs, I don't count points, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as we get to the next question, which is from Deborah. And Deborah says, hello, hello. It is a pleasure to communicate with you. I find you to be an incredible resource for me. Dr. Goldhammer thought maybe you could provide me with further insight. I have been a successful member of Food Addicts in Recovery Anonymous for 11 years. No flour, no sugar, and no unmeasured and only committed quantities. Over a year ago, I turned whole food plant-based and had my light bulb moment where I don't feel addicted to broccoli, smiley face. I was wondering if you could provide any insight about transferring out of such a regimented lifestyle. For example, do you eat more than three times a day? So, that question I thought about all week. And I'm gonna give my opinion, and then what I'm going to do is it doesn't matter what I say because unless you guys hear it from a doctor, you're not gonna believe it. So next week, I'm interviewing Dr. Doug Lyle just on this topic of weighing and measuring and its efficacy. So I'll get to the point, do I eat more than three times a day? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think about it because now that I have, I believe, recovered from food addiction or I'm food addict in recovery, however you wanna say it, I eat when hungry, I stop when full. I would say that I eat at least two times a day on most days. I tend not to snack because I feel that if, you, if I need to snack, it's because I didn't eat enough at meals. Um, probably about two meals because I exercise in the morning and I can't exercise when I've had anything in my stomach, even a banana. And so by the time I get home, it's like 11 or 12. And so, you know, that's kind of breakfast, lunch, or lunch, you know, kind of put together. And then dinner. Um, if I did snack, and I, I, I don't snack like most people snack, like on air pop popcorn or chips, you know, my, my philosophy is if I'm not hungry enough to eat vegetables, I'm not hungry. So, you know, I might eat some more vegetables, some carrots, things like that, some cooked artichokes, maybe a piece of fruit. So, um, do I eat more than three times a day? Probably not, even, even if I eat three times a day. Um, so that's me. But here's the thing about weighing and measuring, and then I'm gonna give you my idea as a way of maybe to transition out of it. And I'm gonna do a little bit of an uh, example of calorie density, which if you refer back to previous Weight Loss Wednesdays, there's one with jars that I really encourage you to see. Now, I have the privilege of speaking at a lot of medical conferences and a lot of hospitals, and one of the things that I get asked to do a lot when I go to these conferences is moderate the expert panels. And I think it was Atlanta last year at the Remedy Food Conference. I might, I might have the conference wrong, but I was monitoring a panel of doctors. And I know that Dr. Baxter Montgomery was on it and Dr. Ellen Goldhammer and maybe Dr. Lyle. I'm sorry, I don't remember. The, I, I'm like every week is a different conference. But that question was asked about the efficacy of weighing and measuring food. I have never known one of the doctors in the plant-based movement, all who I respect and admire, who's, on whose shoulders I stand that I be, may become tall, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Furman, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Gregor, you know, all, people, dietitians like Brenda Davis, and I know I'm probably missing, uh, you know, other doctors, uh, but the point I'm trying to make is I have never known one of them that ever advocates weighing and measuring your food if you're eating the right food, which is a whole food plant-based diet holding the operative word is reading whole foods you're not eating oil which is the most calorically dense food on the planet and a processed food and I remember that uh, that that was basically their answer that there is never going to be a need to weigh and measure your food unless you're not eating the right food the diet consistent with our species natural history and I remember Dr. Lyle saying that that you know of the millions of species that exist in nature only three have ever been overweight human beings, domesticated dogs, and domesticated cats. And animals in nature are never overweight. And the reason these three species are overweight is not just because we live indoors, because we're the only three species that are eating processed foods, pretty much. And I remember Dr. Lyle saying something to the effect of, you know, there's never been a gazelle on the African savanna thinking if they should eat one blade of grass or two. Now, here's the thing. If you understand calorie density, if you really understand it, there is no way you can be obese and pretty much impossible to be overweight. Now, I, I am not here to bash food addiction programs because I've never been in one, but I gotta tell you, I get a lot of clients from them. And if they work, why are they coming to me? See, every diet works, but you have to be willing to do it forever. And weighing and measuring, of course, will work because that's portion control. 
but then you have to be willing to do it the rest of your life. Is it sustainable? I know that I couldn't do it. It would drive me crazy because I eat a style called ad libitum. As much as I want, as often as I want, whenever I want, until I'm comfortably full, but of the right foods. And if you eat only the foods to the left of the red line and aren't adding harmful chemicals like sugar, oil, salt, and flour, which fool your brain's satiety mechanisms, you can eat in this style. Now, we have lining our digestive tracts, stretch receptors, nutrient receptors, and calorie receptors. And the thing is, is the way that people are eating on these food addiction programs, I don't know how they're ever going to activate their stretch receptors. It seems to me that that amount of food, their people are going to be very hungry. And any time you eat under the hunger drive, and by the way, the only thing that really satisfies the hunger drive anyway is complex carbohydrates like potatoes, rice, and beans, the foods that are limited and most people are afraid to eat. Any time you eat under the hunger drive, you're, it's going to backfire and you're going to end up being so hungry that eventually you're going to gain weight. Now, if these programs worked, why are there, why is the recidivism rate like 98%? Only 2% of people that ever lose weight keep it off for more than two years. And it doesn't matter what program they do. So one of my clients that came to me, the, I don't know which plan she's on, but her food plan was something like for each meal of the day, and again, there was no snacks, it was, and you have to report it to your sponsor, and there's like a whole big process. And, and by the way, I'm not bashing these programs. I don't know them. I've never been in them. If they work for you, great. But here's the thing. Do they work What for other people? Because I want to refer you to the work of Dr. Lance Dotis, and I'm going to be interviewing him. He's a local doctor here in Los Angeles who wrote many wonderful books about addiction, and his, ta his take on addiction is absolutely fabulous, by the way. And he wrote a book called The Sober Truth, which was referred to me by uh, someone I respect very much, Dr. Pam Popper, and also Dr. Howard Jacobson, the co-author of Whole and Proteinaholic. And Dr. Dotis says that 12-step programs, at least when he was talking about AA, are, do more harm than good. And that the reality is, is that we only hear about the success stories in AA. And again, I'm not bashing AA, especially if it works for you. I'm just reporting what I heard when I heard his interview about these programs. Is that only about 5% of people that go to AA ever truly remain sober? And the success rate of people not going to AA is actually even higher, but there are many people that are harmed by these programs. But what works about these programs, which is what I'm guessing works about the food addiction programs, is the camaraderie, is the brotherhood, is the support, which you can get in other ways as well. And I'm not telling you not to leave them. But like I say, I get over 100 emails every day, I have for the last five years, asking about weight loss, the ultimate weight loss program. And more than 10% are people that are in these programs that are struggling, that are suffering, that are starving, or that are going crazy having to do that, or embarrassed by having to take their food scale everywhere, or that have gained all their weight back and then some on them. So the client that I just got, her food plan was four ounces for every meal, four ounces of protein, six ounces of starch, which I'm guessing is like rice or sweet potato, and seven ounces of non-starchy vegetable or salad. This was every meal, which means that four plus six is 10. That means she was eating 17 ounces of food at every meal, times three is 51 ounces of food. That's less food than I eat in one meal. So I don't know how you could not starve on that plan. Now, the other thing she said is she was required to eat one tablespoon of oil. Bailey, you're going to have to get down because I've I got to go get something to show you guys something. Hold on. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. Oh, boy. All right. Now, sorry. She said that she was required to eat one tablespoon of oil at every single meal. Now, this is what one tablespoon of oil looks like. This is 120 calories, and it's 14 grams of fat. Now, she had to do three of these a day. She had to eat this much oil every day, 360. No, actually, this is 130 calories. I checked the bottle. So she had to eat three tablespoons of oil every day, 390 calories. 14 times three is 28, three, like four. Anyway, four, about 42 grams of fat a day. She's eating more fat in a day than I eat in an entire week. But for this same 130 calories right here, which she had to eat at every meal, you could have, whoops, I don't know if you can see this, this much zucchini. What do you think is gonna fill you up more? This has fiber, water, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and micronutrients. This has none. This is 4,000 calories a pound. This is 100 calories a pound, a 40-fold difference. And so if you're required to eat high-fat foods and animal products, foods to the right of the red line, of course you're going to have to weigh and measure. So for 130 calories, you can have this, 
or you could have this. For 130 calories, you can have this much salad. And you don't need fat on the salad. You can make a delicious fat-free dressing or balsamic vinegar. And this is going to fill you up. And see, that's why I don't have to count calories or weigh or measure my food because I'm not eating toxins and poisons like oil and cheese and animal products. And the problem is, is Americans don't want to give up these foods. And the only way that you are not going to be fat on any version of the standard American diet or eating any amount of animal products and processed food is if you weigh and measure your food. Now, what I do like about most of these food addiction products is I like the stand on no, no flour and sugar, but I'm told that some of them actually do allow flour and dairy and they're allowing salt and oil and, and things like that. So this is 130 calories, this is 130 calories. You wanna have some Oreos? Here's 130 calories. This is eight miniature Oreos. They gave this to me on the plane. You see, this, see what I'm saying? Or we could have instead two apples. Shoot, now this is why I needed Kenny because I had this all set up earlier. So. What I'm trying to say is, if you're struggling with getting out of a food addiction program, you might need somebody to coach you through it, like a Dr. Doug Lyle or my partner, John Pierre, so that you can understand that you really can eat this way and eat more and weigh less and not worry about gaining weight and not being out of control if you're eating the right food. If you're not eating these high fat foods and processed foods and animal products, I'm gonna see if I can try to have this all together. So for that, 390 calories that she had to eat every day from oil. Look what I'm getting. This is my 390 calories. And this has no fat. And if you read only one book the rest of your life, well, you need to. You need to read The Pleasure Trap. But read Dr. McDougall's program for maximum weight loss. Understand that the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And when you don't eat fat, you don't wear fat. And so you can eat all this. Look at this. This is less than 400 calories. Or you can have this, which she, or excuse me, this, this is 400 calories. Or this is what she was crying. When you understand that you cannot convert protein and carbohydrate to fat, that is called de novo lipogenesis. It's in Dr. McDougall's book. Pigs can do it, human beings can't. If you eat excess protein or carbohydrates, it gets burned as heat, escaping through the top of the head as the fidget factor or stored invisibly in the muscles or the liver as glycogen. And so I'm not telling you to overeat, but most people, or many people um, that are suffering from food addiction or emotional eaters, you can overeat on this stuff if you can, but you can't because it's so full of water and fiber. So Deborah, what I would recommend to you is that if you're scared to go from a strict weighing and measuring program to eating like I do ad libitum, like six to 10 pounds of food a day and just keep getting more slender, is at least give yourself permission not to weigh and measure your non-starchy vegetables. No one ever got fat from eating too much kale unless they were putting oil or butter or cheese or salt on it. And so at least let that go. You cannot ever, ever be overweight eating vegetables. There are 100 calories a pound. There is no way it could happen. Every diet style out there allows you to eat most vegetables, not most, I mean all vegetables ad libitum, even paleo, styles I don't agree with, even Weight Watchers has made vegetables free. And to me, a diet style that limits you to seven ounces in a meal, I mean, that's like nothing. And to me, that's like the healthiest thing you can do to reverse the cravings, to reverse food addiction is to eat vegetables. So for me, I've never done these programs, I don't think I could ever do them because it's such a small amount of food. And the other thing is, is it's a one size fits all. How can everybody have the same food plan? I mean, we have people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program that are four foot 10, and we have people that are six foot four. They're different sexes, different metabolisms. How can you tell everybody to eat four ounces of protein, whatever that is? By the way, there's protein in everything. There's more protein in green vegetables than even in steak. 100 calories of broccoli has 11.2 grams of protein, whereas 100 calories of steak has 5.4. So to even have a protein, I don't even and understand that but how can you tell people to all eat the same amount of food when they're different sexes different heights different ages different metabolisms and different activity levels I mean on days that I'm sitting doing nothing I don't get that hungry but on days that I spin or do a 90 minute yoga class I'm starving and a lot of these food addiction programs tell you not to exercise because it'll deplete willpower and Dr. Doug Lyle will tell you the exact opposite so uh, again I defer to him 
because I know whatever I say, you're not going to believe till you hear from him. So make sure you're signed up for my mailing list at eatonprocess.com so that you can see that interview when it comes out so that you can ask me more questions on Weight Loss Wednesday. But please, guys, don't be afraid to eat vegetables, potatoes, rice, beans. Be afraid to eat animal products. Be afraid to eat sugar, flour, and alcohol and all those foods to the right of the red line. But when you really understand calorie density, you really can eat twice as much food take in half as many calories and still have the health and the body you deserve. I'm Chef AJ and thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.